Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're coming to you live from the Stanford campus. I'm Fedra Puide, an associate director at the Stanford Alumni Association. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, I'm happy to be moderating today's special session, Personal Branding 101, with Susanna Scully, our special guest coach today, who's volunteered to be with us. If you want to reach us at any time online, please visit our website. It's alumni.stanford.edu. And here you'll find Stanford Career Connect under resources. That's where we keep all of our career resources for Stanford alums and for students. Students are also eligible. You'll find our job board, the alumni directory, our career tools, and all of our career-related social media. And if you look for Stanford Career Connect, you'll see all of our career tools. We're also happy to continue to bring you resources like the interactive session today, Personal Branding 101. Over time, especially the past year, you've asked us a lot about personal branding. So today we'll be answering some of your questions and giving you the basic frameworks to get started with personal branding. It's a live interactive session, so please, if you're watching this today live, comment in the comment section below the live stream and ask your questions. Or you can tweet your questions to hashtag Stanford Alum Chat. And we'll be giving a presentation today and stopping periodically to answer those questions. Don't worry if we don't get to your question. If we run out of time, Susanna has graciously offered to continue answering questions in the comments section off camera. So keep typing and she'll respond via a written response afterwards. And of course, if you want to contact her afterwards for more individualized, special one-on-one -on -one coaching, feel free to reach out to her directly at her website or via Twitter. You can see the contact information now. We're so excited to have Susanna here with, our, with, with us today. She has been very active with the Stanford community. She's an executive coach, speaker, and blogger. She's worked with various companies and various Bay Area executives from companies ranging from Sony to Square, Google to Genentech, and various startups. She's also been featured on Daily Candy, and she was nominated for 7x7 Seven Seven Magazine's Entrepreneur Top 20 Under 40. So today she'll begin by talking a little about her mission and then delving into the basics of personal branding to help you get started. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you Susanna Scully. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you, Freddie, and thank you so much for having me here today. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here. My husband is a Stanford alum, and I grew up in the Bay Area, so Stanford has always felt like home to me. And the topic of personal branding is very near and dear to my heart, as my mission is to connect who you are to what you do. And to me, personal branding is how we communicate that. So my background is from the corporate world. I worked in corporate retail, working for Gap Inc., Williams-Sonoma Inc., and I started my own practice as an executive coach about six years ago, where I help both individuals and companies create meaning in the workplace. So that's why today is very exciting for me. To talk a little bit about personal branding today, we're going to touch on what is personal branding, why is it important? And how do you use it in your career effectively? Now, again, as Fetty mentioned, if they're watching this live and there are any questions you have, please type them in the comments and we'll be answering them periodically throughout the presentation today. So let's get started. What is personal branding? Personal branding is the process by which we market ourselves to others. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, personal branding, I'm not a brand, I'm a person. Why would I be branding myself? Well, let me tell you this. You already have a personal brand. Whether you know it or not, you have a personal brand. So the question is not, should I have one or should I not? The question is, are you going to manage it or not? And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Why is it important? Why should you have it? And what does it look like? Now, who is personal branding for? Again, to my earlier point, personal branding is for everyone not just for professionals, for everyone. But today, we're gonna to be talking specifically about professionals. So we broke it into three different career buckets. The first, job seekers. Second, entrepreneurs. And third, leaders. Now let me take a moment and talk more about each of these. What's similar in each of these is that job seekers, entrepreneurs, and leaders all want to know and be regarded as experts in their industry. 
right? That's how everybody wants to be viewed. Now, what's different for each of these is the audience by which they are marketing themselves to. For job seekers, it's employers that want to feel that they're going to add value to their company. For entrepreneurs, it's to the marketplace, to potential customers or clients. And for leaders, it's often within their organizations and by their peers and the industry. So again, personal branding is important for everybody to be thinking about. Now, if you don't mind, if you're watching this live, we'd love for you to take a moment and say, which one are you? Are you a job seeker, an entrepreneur, or a leader? Take a moment and answer that just so we can get a feel of, of who's out there and, and what you're looking for. While you're doing that, let's take a moment and talk about the how of personal branding. How do we use it? As I said, each of us has a personal brand, whether we know it or not. There's two ways that personal branding shows up. The first, online. And we're going to get into more detail about this later, but your personal brand is everywhere online. Do a quick Google search of yourself. What comes up first? Does anything come up? Does what you want to come up? Again, we'll be going through all the different social media platforms in more depth later, but I think a Google search is a great way just to get a quick sense of what the feel is for your personal brand. Now, what about in person? What is your in-person personal brand? A great way to think about this is to ask people you know, what am I known for? How would you describe me? A lot of it is your reputation. So an easy way is to, again, ask people what they think you're known for. And we'll get more into depth with this later. What does this mean for you and your personal brand? Today, we're going to be talking about three steps to defining your personal brand. First, we're going to talk about how to define your aspirations. Then, we're going to talk about how to determine your unique value proposition. And third, we're going to be talking about how to communicate your personal brand. Step one, oh, do we have time for a few questions or should we jump in? Um, do you want to jump in and do the questions at the end of Perfect. section one? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Excellent. great. They're rolling in. Continue to please submit your questions in the comments section. And again, we'll answer them as best as we can within the time frame. Thank you. Great. So jumping in, step one, defining your personal aspirations. One of my favorite quotes about personal branding is from Seneca. To the person who does not know where he wants to go, there is no favorable wind. Why is this my favorite quote? Because I've noticed this with my clients, that they often fall into their careers. They know somebody who knows a job, and then 10 years later they wake up and they don't know how they ended up there. So wherever the wind blows, they go. So personal branding is about being really intentional about where is the direction that you want to go. Let's take a moment to do an exercise around this. An exercise I do with my clients is think about 10 years from now. What do you want to be known for? And a great framework for this is to imagine 10 years from now you're at a dinner party and you don't know anyone but the hostess and the hostess is introducing you. How do you want her to introduce you? For example, they'll say, Suzanne, this is Susanna. She is known for blank. She has accomplished blank. If you want to talk about blank, you want to talk to her. And a great way to think about this is not just professionally, but personally as well. Do you want to be known as a great photographer, throwing great parties, uh, bike rider? What do you want to be known for? So while you're taking a moment and answering that, jotting that down, why don't we see what questions are coming up? Betty? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a few questions coming in, and we had some come in before the session. So let's start with a few that we received pretty early on. Great. And I think I know the answer to this, but are there <laughs> common mistakes that people make? Yes. There are three common mistakes that I see people making. The first, back to what we said, is they don't know where they're going. So again, there's no favorable wind. So their personal brand is... Um, is a reactive as opposed to proactive. So that's the number one mistake, is they don't know what they want. Number two is once they know what they want, they don't know what makes them unique, why they are uniquely set up to achieve what they want. And the third I see is that people don't ask for help. 
everybody loves to help. And I know it's very vulnerable to ask, it could be scary, but really, if you want to achieve what you want and you want to get ahead, it is through other people. So I highly encourage asking for help. Uh, does everyone need to think about personal branding or are there only specific professions that really need to think about personal branding? Yes, everybody needs to think about personal branding. As I said before, whether you know it or not, you have a personal brand. The question is, are you managing it? So whatever profession you're in, even if you're a stay-at-home mom, I still, and you don't have any intention of going back into the workforce, you still want to manage your personal brand and be relevant as there's always a direction that we're headed. So absolutely everybody should have a personal brand. What's the single most important thing that people should do when they want to establish their personal brand? Know what you want. And I know that is the hardest thing for people. It's so easy. I could answer and say, oh, create a Twitter page, update your LinkedIn, you know, get on Facebook. And those are the easy answers. But if you don't know what you want, then doing those things are not going to get you anywhere. So the number one most important thing is to be very clear about what you want and what you have to offer. Great. Great. So I think we can move into section two now if you wanted to continue. We'll break later for additional questions. Thank you for keeping your questions coming. Perfect. Thank you. So let's move into step two, determining your unique value proposition. Now I know when you hear unique value proposition, you may think about a product. Again, a lot of this sounds like we're marketing a product instead of a person, but there are real parallels between that. You are marketing yourself. So the way I think about unique value proposition for a person, I break it into three steps. The first is thinking about your natural talents, then thinking about your skills, and then thinking about your passions. Let's break them down. Natural talents. How do you determine what your natural talents are? One way I like to think about them are, what came easily to you as a child? You could even ask your parents or friends, or how would your friends describe you? What just naturally is a part of you that you really don't have to do work very hard at? So examples of natural talents of some of my clients. Writing is often a natural talent for people. Public speaking can be a natural talent. Academics could be a natural talent. Or something like getting to the root of a problem. I've heard actually quite a few clients say that they're able to take a look and have an assessment of a whole situation and really boil it down to one key thing. That is a natural talent. Now let's move into skills. What are skills? Skills are those things that you put on your resume, what you've learned along the way. Another way I like to think about it is if you were dropped in the middle of nowhere and had to earn money, what could you do? What are the skills you've learned? So for example, project management, managing people, budgeting, things such as that, those are skills that you have. Now passions, I know this is a touchy subject. You often hear people say, follow your passion and the rest will make sense. I have to say, I don't 100% agree with that. To me, there's a unique blend of your natural talents, your skills, and your passions. So for your passions, think about when you walk into a bookstore, which area do you find yourself gravitating towards? Is it to the magazine section? And if it is, which magazines are you picking up? Are you picking up Entrepreneur Magazine? Are you picking up Us Weekly? Are you passionate about pop culture? Do you go to the fiction section, the nonfiction section? Really, I think what it comes back to is being very mindful of what your interests are. So how do we bring these together to, to really create a sentence on your unique value proposition? Here's one that I've come up with. I use my natural talents of blank and my blank skills to have an impact in the blank industry. Let me use myself as an example. I use my natural talents of connecting with others and my coaching skills to have an impact in the professional development industry. Now, before everybody starts to freak out that they don't know what their natural talents are, what their skills are, and what the industry is, it's okay. Um, this is the work to do, is to really spend some time around this. It isn't something that you can just whip up. Take some time, and I would recommend going somewhere away from 
away from distractions, go to a coffee shop, and really spend time on each of these exercises. And then try them on for size, try different things, see how they feel, share them with friends or with coworkers. This is really important work and foundational work that I believe everybody should be doing for their personal brand. Now let's see, do we have questions? Yeah, this would be a great time. And, great. and I, I love what you're saying about a unique value proposition. I think, I was just thinking I need to sit down and spend yeah. some time yeah. Good. <laughs> really Talk to me. writing that. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> thanks okay. for being here. Yeah. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, this one, I have a hard time identifying a niche where I can mm -hmm. be an expert. Yes. How do I do that and what advice can you give me? This is something I hear quite often. How do I determine my niche? What do I want to be an expert in? So there's a few things I would say, a framework for you. But before I jump into the framework, I want to say that a niche is not something that comes immediately. So go easy on yourself. I've noticed that A, a niche can change throughout the years and that's okay. Number two, you have to try a lot of different things. Try it on for size, see how it feels. So. Um, don't expect to immediately snap your fingers and, hey, here's the niche I'm an expert in. So I, I want to encourage everybody for that. But in thinking about it, just to give a framework, number one is think about your interests. Going back to what we said before, where do you notice that you have a lot of interest? Where do you get, where do you lose track of time? What books are you always checking out? What do you love talking about? So that's the first, think about interest. Second, think about the marketplace. Where are you noticing that there's a need in the marketplace in relation to your interests? So for example, a lot of my clients talk about they're very interested in health and wellness. That's something, a very common interest that I hear. So in thinking about that in the marketplace, where do you see a need? Healthcare, for example, particularly in the Bay Area is a really hot topic. So where could you have an impact there? And that leads to our third piece for the framework. What unique strengths do you have where you could impact your interest and the need in the marketplace? So that's a great place to start in terms of thinking about where do I want, what niche do I want to be an expert in? Great. We have some viewers who are in the mid-career stage yep. of their lives. Yep. So what advice do you have for them in terms of building a brand and trying to become an expert maybe in an area where there are already a lot of experts? Uh, so thinking about where there's already a lot of experts already, this is a common thing that our mind plays on us. Well, everybody else is great at this. Why, what do I have to add to it? So I'm gonna share two anecdotes about this. The first is going back to my childhood. <clears throat> I remember growing up, I came home and there was a girl who had beat me in a race, right? And I was very competitive growing up. And, um, and I remember coming home and saying, Mom, she beat me in this race and then somebody got the better grade than me. And I'll always remember her saying, listen, Susanna, there will always be somebody faster than you, smarter than you, funnier than you, but no one will ever be the unique blend of you. And I, this may sound cheesy, but it is very important to remember you want to sell the unique blend of you. That is what you're selling to people, not being one or the other. Let me use another anecdote. When I left my job at Williams-Sonoma, I was a buyer, and I applied to a position as director of marketing for the third largest wine company in the world. I had never done marketing before, and I didn't know anything about wine other than I liked to drink it. So in sitting with the CEO as I was interviewing, I had to sell, not that I was an expert in wine, not that I was an expert in marketing, but instead I had to sell my natural talents, the skills I had before, and how they translated into this. So again, I was selling the unique blend of me and not specifics of exactly what they wanted to hear. So that is what I would encourage everybody to do. Well, speaking of unique, what if someone has a quirky personality? Quirky, okay. So how yes. do they build Don't we a all? brand? <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. How do we build a personal brand around a very unique okay. personality without losing one's identity? Yeah. So that immediately makes me think of one person in particular who in my mind is one of the quirkiest people I know and second, one of the best at personal branding. And that person is Richard Branson.
For those of you who don't know who Richard Branson is, he is the CEO and founder, actually I don't know if he's the CEO, but he's the founder of Virgin, which is Virgin America, Virgin Music. And he has one of the quirkiest personalities that I've seen, jumping from airplanes, um, doing crazy things. And he has done such an incredible job because we, because he's himself, we all resonate with him. We can connect with him. And I think that is one of the most important things is to be yourself. That is what people are going to connect with. And the other thing to think about is go where you're appreciated, right? Surround yourself with like-minded people where they love the uniqueness in you. Don't try and fit yourself into somewhere where they don't honor and respect and, and love your uniqueness. Make sure that you find that place and the only way you will is by being yourself. Wonderful. So I think we have some questions coming in, but I'd like to save those maybe until you Perfect. work through the third section and then we'll revisit some of the questions. Thanks again to the audience for submitting your comments. Great questions. Okay, keep going. Step three. Now, now that you have your personal brand, how do you effectively communicate this personal brand? Let's jump into creating a personal brand statement. There's a few things that play into it. You have your vision, your unique value proposition, your work experience, and your desired opportunities. Let's talk a bit more about each of these. So vision we've talked about, where is it that you wanna go? And 10 years from now, where do you wanna be? Where do you see yourself? Number two, your unique value proposition. What is it that makes you unique? What makes you stand out? What is that blend of you? Three, your work experience. Let's talk a little bit about this in terms of your personal brand. Oftentimes what I hear from clients is, I have this work experience, but it doesn't translate into what I'm doing. And what I find is that oftentimes they're thinking very literally. Uh, you know, if I was in finance, how could I go work for an environmental tech startup? And the truth of it is, there's always things that you could take to craft your story about how that can have an impact. So just use that as an example of finance to an environmental tech startup. What you want to be thinking about is, have you had experience in your finance company where you worked with people in that industry? And if you didn't, are there things you've done personally? And if you haven't done anything personally, start doing something personally, right? It doesn't always have to be direct work experience. So I think that's an important thing to note is that employers are looking for a breadth of experience. And actually more so than ever before is that they really want that whole part of you, not just the resume items. So it's important to make sure that you are really delving into what interests you. Last is desired opportunities. So think about what are those opportunities that would be great? What would you, it goes back to your vision, but I think vision is more wide, um, general speaking. Opportunities is thinking, well, within that vision, along the way, what would I like to do? And on that note, I, I wanna mention that something I talk a lot with my clients about is that we don't focus, we shouldn't focus just on that end vision. You want to think about what experiences do I want to have along the way? What kind of people do I want to be surrounding myself with? What do I want to be learning along the way? And then think about within each job, are they adding up to that? Will I get the experience that I want? What are the opportunities I can be looking for? So let's keep going. An example of a personal brand statement that I really liked. Through my natural enthusiasm and empathy for others, I inspire research and development professionals to develop innovative products in biotechnology. This came from a biotech manager. Now what do I like about this? She talks about her natural talents. She says, my natural enthusiasm and my empathy for others. Now, some may think, oh, enthusiasm, empathy, are those really valued in the workplace? And here she, she, she translates that into 
Her enthusiasm and her empathy inspires research and development professionals. So she really understands the interconnectedness of her strengths to other people's strengths. And she inspires them to develop innovative products in biotechnology. While she may not be developing those products, if it weren't for her, then those products would not be made. So I think that's a great example of her knowing what is her value, what is her strength, and where is she going to have an impact. Now, what does this mean on a daily basis? This is something I, I know a lot of questions came through. How do I manage my brand on a daily basis? So if you're looking at the slide now, what I did here was create a funnel. And the funnel was imagining that we took a snapshot of your daily engagement online. In that funnel, I included your network. Who's your network? People that you're friends with on Facebook. Who you're connected with on LinkedIn. Who you follow on Twitter. This is all part of your network. Status updates. Again, this is Facebook, this is Twitter, LinkedIn, and there's countless others. Quora, I mean, I, there's, a, there's a lot of them. And then social sharing. What kind of articles are you sharing? What are you commenting on? online? What are you liking? All of this adds up. If I were to look at each of this for you and take a snapshot, this is how others perceive you. I would get a sense of who you are based on your network, your status updates, and your social sharing. So take a moment and, and even notice today, be very mindful of, of what you're sharing, what you're liking, and who you follow. And does it reflect the person that you want to reflect. There is no right or wrong, it's just something to think about. Now, let's jump into a hot topic, social media platforms. Before I begin, I wanna say that in going into each of these, I am not going to give a full in-depth explanation or of each one of these, nor a tutorial, but please know there are great tutorials online for each one of these social media platforms. A great place to look also for information is Mashable.com is one that I really like, enjoy reading. So let's go into which ones should you use, why are they important, and what are my thoughts on them? Again, one final note is I do not believe that necessarily one is better than the other. I believe that you should engage on the social media platform that you enjoy the most. Whatever resonates with you is the right one to do. So let's jump in. I'll start with my personal favorite, which is Twitter. Why do I love Twitter? I love Twitter because there's three reasons. One is it allows you to engage with people you would never be able to engage with. I could tweet to a CEO of a company and immediately they see it and the likelihood is fairly great that they tweet me back. When else can I do that? It's, it's always just amazing to me. The second thing is building a community. A lot of people may not believe it, but I truly have created really meaningful, deep relationships with people I've met on Twitter. And that may sound weird, but one of my closest friends is a girl I met on Twitter. She and I noticed that we were following similar people. We liked what each other were writing about on our blogs. And then we met up for coffee. That was about two years ago, and she's one of my closest friends. So I love that aspect of Twitter. The other part I love about Twitter is that it enables you to create a real community of like-minded people, that we're sharing similar things. We are, I can get exposure based on, I become, back to this niche that we were talking about, that you'll wanna follow, follow me if you wanna know about meaning in the workplace, that I'm gonna be sharing great articles about it, that I'm going to be sharing new resources and people to follow. So as you can tell, I really love Twitter. So let's move into another one, Facebook. What about Facebook? Facebook, there's two parts to it. So the first is Facebook for personal reasons. You have a Facebook page, you have your friends, you share pictures of your kids or your dog or whatever it is, and that's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to engage and stay updated. Now, one of the important things is that even though it's mostly for personal purposes, I can guarantee you that potential clients, potential employers, 
everybody is looking you up on Facebook. When they see your name, they type you into the search box on Facebook. They want to get a sense of who are you. So you want to be, take notice of is your personal brand on Facebook reflective of how you want to be perceived? It's just to be, again, all of this is about being very mindful about how you're showing yourself online. Now, the other part of Facebook are Facebook fan pages. And I get asked a lot, should I have a Facebook page? There's not a right or wrong answer. The question is more, what is your purpose? What is your goal for it? So for example, I have a Facebook fan page for my business. And that is how I'm able to distinguish my professional perception versus my personal. And I'll share in between back and forth, but I believe your fan page is often for entrepreneurs, for a product. Um, it's really, generally speaking, not for somebody who is looking to get employed. Um, there's no need for a Facebook fan page in that case. LinkedIn. I could talk a lot about LinkedIn. There's a lot to say, and that's a whole other webinar, but let me just give a top line. Should everybody have a LinkedIn page? My answer is definitely. Should it be updated? Definitely. Okay, why? LinkedIn, again, just the same as people are looking you up on Facebook, they are also looking you up on LinkedIn. What are they looking for on LinkedIn? Number one is to make sure you have a very professional photo. I can't tell you how many times I see people with a photo of them from a, you know, out to dinner and half of a friend's face is cut off and they're kind of doing this. This is not, that's for your Facebook, that is not for your LinkedIn page. And if you don't want to do a professional photo, stand in front of a white wall and have a friend take a photo of you dressed nicely and that should be your, your LinkedIn profile photo. So that's one note, put that on your to-do list, make sure that that is a professional photo. Other things to think about, your summary. That's a great place to put what we talked about, your unique value proposition. What, if somebody wants to look and just get a snapshot of who you are and what you stand for and how you add value, that should all be in your summary statement. So that's important. And then as well, make sure that you have listed all of your work experience, your education, all of that should be included on your LinkedIn and they make it very easy. You literally can upload your resume and then it populates immediately to LinkedIn. So it's very simple to do that. Other things to think about in terms of LinkedIn, who are you connected with? Now I heard a great piece of advice with LinkedIn in terms of your network and who should you connect with and who you shouldn't. They said on your LinkedIn, your connections, you should think about, would you ask this person for a favor? And I thought that was really great. So only accept, and again, this is a philosophy, this is not hard, fast rules, but think about on your connections, would you ask them for a favor? Because oftentimes people are asking each other for favors on LinkedIn. So for example, Fetty, I see you are connected to Salva, could I, could you make an introduction? So you want to make sure that that's a part of who you're connected with. Again, we could talk at great length about LinkedIn, uh, but those are some of the top line things to think about. Pinterest, another hot social media platform. What does Pinterest mean from a professional standpoint? I think again, if you fall into the entrepreneur or thought leader um, bucket, I think it's important to be on Pinterest to give a point of view of what you're looking at online and give a sense of who you are. For the job seeker, unless you are looking into something artistic, I don't believe it's as important. But it is a great deal of fun and can be very addictive, so I highly recommend checking it out if you hadn't. But from a job seeker perspective, I don't believe that LinkedIn, or excuse me, that Pinterest is as important. Instagram. Again, Instagram is a great one for entrepreneurs, potentially for leaders, for the job seeker. Unless it's artistic, I don't believe it's as important to be on Instagram. YouTube. Again, these all fall into the same uh, buckets. YouTube is great if you are an entrepreneur. I have a YouTube page and it's a great place for me to speak in front of a group and, and 
and have that all on video and that people can check out anytime. Uh, but other than that, I don't think it's important for a job seeker. Google Plus. So this is more of an up and, I should say up and coming, but what's great about Google Plus are two things. One is they have communities built into that. So it's a great way to connect with like-minded people. The other great place about Google Plus is they have Hangouts. And that's where you can do video chats with friends or other people in your network or meet new people. That's another great part about Google Plus. Blog, should you or should you not have a blog? This is a question I get asked all of the time. The answer to that question is, do you enjoy writing? If you enjoy writing and enjoy blogging, yes, you should have a blog. If you don't enjoy writing and don't enjoy blogging, you do not need a blog. There are so many other places that you can engage in 140 characters or less on Twitter. And again, we could go in great depth about a blog, but there's so many easy platforms now for people to put up a blog. So for example, WordPress is a great one. They make it very simple. Um, now let's move into landing page. This is something that I think people aren't quite as familiar with, but I think should be. A landing page is a place to aggregate all of your social media. So one example is about.me. There's another one called Flavorful. But essentially, if you don't have a website, you, you, they make it all very easy for you. So you have up there your photo, your name, and then it links to your Twitter page, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn. And you can have this as your URL for everyone. It's essentially like a business card, but online. So I think it's important that everybody have a landing page. Now, before we move on, I thought maybe we could stop and ask answer Ab questions. Absolutely. I like what you're saying about having a central location. Yeah. If people ask me, where can I go online to find out more yes. about you? I love this idea of sending them to one particular yes. spot. Me too. It's very helpful and timely. So speaking of blogging, we have yeah. some bloggers writing and some job seekers okay. writing in. One question is, I keep a blog that relates to my industry and field of work. How can I specifically leverage it to connect with employers? Yeah. Well, first, I want to say that is great that you have a blog. I know that it is not always easy, both from a place of discipline, of writing. The second is from a place of vulnerability, of sharing your thoughts. That I know that's scary for a lot of people. So great job having a blog. Now, how do you leverage it with employees? There's a few ways you can do that. Number one is you always want to be adding value. So in thinking about, let me use an example. Let's say you are looking to work for an advertising firm. Through your blog, you want to add value to that advertising agency prior to working there. So for example, you could blog about campaigns that you've been seeing and what your thoughts are and give an analysis of it. And then you could tweet to them, hey, at whatever, it, advertising agency it is, here is a piece I wrote that I thought you would enjoy. It's a great way that you've truly added value to them without working there. So I would say number one is to be thinking about how can you showcase your expertise, your insight, your thoughts. The second is engage with them and Twitter is a great place to do, it, to do that. And then third is if you get to a point where you're going to apply for a position, I would definitely include that in your cover letter. Here's a link to my blog, assuming that your blog is not just about your dog or something like that. You, but if your blog is really about the industry and, and your insight, then I would include that. Because again, employers are looking for a breadth and they're looking for passion and, and um, again, discipline and, and to show that you're really excited for it. So that's what I would recommend. So we've been talking a lot about personal branding as an online activity. Yeah. But are there things people can do offline? Yes. Someone wrote in. Yes. I would say your offline personal branding is much more important than your online, even though we've been talking the majority of today because that's the questions we get asked a lot is about online because I think that's where people get hung up and lost. There's so many, understandably, there's so many different options. but. Offline is incredibly, incredibly important. And what does that mean, your offline personal brand? What that means is your personal network. Who are you surrounding yourself with? 
what are you hanging out with the people that you want to? I mean, again, it's being very intentional and mindful of the people you surround yourself with. And just to use an example of today's, um, of me being here, this opportunity came through my offline personal branding. So I was speaking with somebody who works with Stanford and show, shared how excited I was about what I'm doing and we made a connection and started chatting that was all done offline. So in terms of how do you build that network, there's a few ways. One is to be up to date on conferences that are happening in your area. And I know that could be very intimidating going to a conference by yourself, but it's a great way to just you don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to, but it's to show up and engage. I think that is the word I really want, engage. And so show up to conferences, look at local meetups, right? Engage with your alumni association. Alumni associations are great for this because they want to help. They're a built-in network for you. So engage with your alumni. And also the last thing is offline is keep sharing with people your personal brand. What is your vision? What is unique? And where do you want to go? So I think that is how you're going to get ahead because again, people want to help. Great, so I think yeah. we can squeeze in one more question Great. before you move to the final, final slides. Yeah. But someone wrote in, how do I measure the effectiveness mm. of my personal brand? That's a great question, how do we know it's working? Yes, how do you know your personal brand is working? That depends on how you're building your personal brand goals. So it's a great point to be thinking about as you're thinking about your personal brand, are you building in measurable goals? So what would a measurable goal look like on a personal brand? Let's go through each bucket. For a job seeker, a measurable goal could be work for um, one of the below, you know, five companies and get a job by December. Great, that's a way, now you've set a goal, it's measurable, you have something to talk to people about to help you get there, and if you get a job in one of those places by December, you know your personal brand has been effective. Now let's keep going, entrepreneur, how do you create a measurable goal as an entrepreneur? Again, thinking about your goals. So let's say as an entrepreneur, your goal is to get press. So again, list out the places that you would love to get press in by X date. And now you can share with your network. I want to be featured in Forbes or Fast Company or Entrepreneur, or whatever it may be, by X date. And then if that is your goal, just to keep going on this personal brand, is start engaging with uh, the writers on Twitter for each of those. Start adding value to them now, not about yourself, but showing you know, hey, I'm up to date on my industry and here's some things that you'll find interesting that I think could make your job easier. And again, how can you measure it? Then if you get featured in one of those, then you've had an effective personal brand. Now, to keep going, on a leader, how do you know? Again, that goes back to your team. How are you regarded? Are you well respected? What's the feedback that you're getting? How do you want to be regarded? It's important to think about all of those things in terms of your personal brand. All right, great, if there aren't any further questions. I'll save them for after. Perfect, <laughs> okay. So to recap, what are the three steps to defining your personal brand? Again, first, define your aspirations. Second, determine your unique value proposition. And third, effectively communicate your brand. Now, what are steps you can take now? First, is add your unique value proposition, that, that statement that we came up with, to your LinkedIn profile. Put it in your summary. I use my blank natural talents and blank skills to add value in the blank industry. It's a great easy thing to do and of course you can add your own words to there but it's a, it's a good framework for that. Second, create a central page linking to your social media platforms. This is what we talked about before using something like about.me. If you don't have a website or you don't have a blog, this is a great place to have a central location linking to everything on there. So I think now we have a little bit more time for some more questions. Yeah, thanks, that really resonates. Um, again, you can always continue to reach Susanna at her website. So we'll take a few more questions as we wrap up the last few minutes of this session. 
But with the remaining time, we have a question that I think is very timely. Okay. So <laughs> that question is about getting laid off. Ah, so how yeah. do you turn a layoff into an opportunity, mm. especially avoiding damaging uh, your professional brand? I love that. How can you turn a lay, being laid off into an opportunity? And it's just as a great framework to be thinking about this. So first I want to say, I, I have a lot of clients who have been laid off and I absolutely understand how hard that can be, uh, both from a emotional, psychological um, standpoint. So first is to just recognize that. And I think it's a, a really important point is to get very clear on what is the lesson that you wanna learn from the situation. So you know, one of my favorite things to say is, Grab the lesson and transcend the situation. Because until you get the lesson, you're gonna stay in that situation for as long as you need to to get the lesson. So in thinking about that, I think everything is about crafting a story. What is the story? How can you turn this into, hey, this wasn't a fit and it gave me an opportunity to do what I really wanna do, which is blank. I think, so get clear on it, on why it didn't work. And it, there's a million reasons. It could be because you weren't a great fit. It could be for budget cuts. There's always, there's, there's different reasons. But get very succinct in how can you describe what happened in one or two sentences. And then move forward on why it's such a great opportunity and why you're so excited. Because now you get to do what you really want to do and what you're really excited about. And having said that, it's not about saying, uh, bad mouthing what happened before, um, how terrible it was, uh, because employers can be very mindful of, of noticing that are they going to do this bad mouth us. So it's a, it's almost taking a, an observant view of it and not being emotionally attached. But here's what happened, and now I'm really excited about this and focus on that. People will follow you wherever you go or wherever your excitement is people follow you. That's what I would encourage if you've been laid off. Excellent. So what if someone doesn't use social media? Mm -hmm. If you don't use social media, how do you build a personal brand? Right. Again, I think it's important in this day and age to have some sort of, excuse me, social media uh, placement online. So whether that means just having a LinkedIn profile, you don't have to do all of them, but I do believe that everybody should have a presence, an online presence in some form. Having said that, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is building your offline brand. So really, again, it's about engaging with others, engaging with people in your community, engaging with people in your network. Whatever feels most natural to you and whichever you enjoy most, go for it, but the, but to make sure that you're not doing this all on your own, that is what personal branding is about. Great. So we have questions usually. I think this one came in online also, yeah. but we I hear this a lot verbally in person. Isn't self, isn't personal branding basically self-promotion and how does one get over that? <laughs> yes, okay. So the answer is yes, it is self-promotion. And then the second question I think, which is really the question is, because I get asked this all the time too, what if I'm not comfortable doing self, prom promoting myself? Right. And again, I'm going to keep reiterating this, do what is comfortable for you. So if it feels uncomfortable to tweet out what you're doing and how great you are, then, then don't do that. What, if what feels comfortable is to share about other people and what you think is really interesting, then do that. If what feels comfortable is showing up and just listening and engaging in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody in person, then do that. So I think, again, personal branding is, is about self-promotion, but that's the end result of it. Really what personal branding is about is knowing what you want, knowing what your strengths are, and engaging on those two fronts. Great. Um, someone writes in, after 35 years of working in line functions, I want to rebrand as a leadership consultant mm -hmm. and coach, which is really what I've done all these years. This person's seeking pointers on how to go about doing that. Hmm. I think it's wonderful that you're doing that is something that is very much needed right now um, in leadership. And again, thinking about the marketplace is something that's, that's very hot. So 
again, on this, first, it's great that they know what they want. They're getting very clear. And it sounds like they are translating their work experience into doing this. So what I would encourage is two things. One is establish yourself as a thought leader in this. How do you do that? Again, this comes back to social media of your choice, but start engaging with other people, other thought leaders in this. Perhaps reach out to them to meet for a coffee or a quick phone call, or start sharing what they, if there's somebody who wrote a great book, then um, help promote that book for them, help share things for them. So that's sort of online presence. And then offline, I would really be talking about it to everybody you know. Here's what I'm excited about. Here's what I want to do. Do you know anybody? And get very specific about what you're looking for and who you want to help and what the value is that you want to add. Great. Someone wrote in, curious to hear about what social media site is best, is best for personal branding and why. Mm. I think you already covered that, but maybe yeah. you want to give a quick summary. Sure, yeah, and 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 again, I'm, I'll keep going back to this. It's whichever one that you feel most comfortable and enjoy doing. But for professional purposes, if I if I had to answer the question, I would say LinkedIn is the most important one for professional networking. Great, yeah. and I think we have time for one more question right. before we we go to the closing. Okay. So this question I think is very important. How do I change or fix an mm. old brand that is no longer an accurate representation of me? Yes. So what if you have a brand that's already yes. been established and, yes. and you'd like to get rid of it yes. or start fresh? Yes. What do you do and how do you go about that? Yes, okay. So what's great about online is that it's really easy to do that. When I say easy, I mean technically easy. So again, first thing is do a Google search of yourself. Notice what is coming up and then go one by one and Take note of, is it reflective of what you, how you want to be perceived of your personal brand? If it's not, go through each one and start changing them. Now, unfortunately, there are some things that we can't delete, right? If you wrote a blog post or on somebody else's site, you, you can't take it down, but how can you manage what you can manage? So again, your Twitter, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, do they have most updated photo? Do they have your unique value proposition? Are you now connected with who you want to be connected with? So again, it's, it's, it's doing um, maintenance, I think is a great word, mindfulness and maintenance. And I think that's actually another point that I haven't mentioned yet is to consistently be checking back in because oftentimes there's things that we forget that we have online and there's inconsistency in between each. So you may have one photo on here and another photo here and on this one you have your old job listing and this one you have. So a Google search should fix that for you to make sure there's a real consistent brand message because you will be Googled. Great. Um, any closing remarks before we wrap up? No, just to say thank you again for having me. This has been, I cannot tell you, so exciting for me and such a joy to share this information. And if there's anyone out there who has further questions or wants more one-on-one -on -one help with yourself or your organization, please contact me after as I love working on this and I'd be happy to help however I can. So again, thank you, Fetty. Thank you, Susanna, for being here. And thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Again, uh, we're out of time, but we'll continue to answer questions off camera in the comments section, so you can keep them coming today. And if you want to find us online, just a reminder, it's alumni.stanford.edu. Look for Stanford Career Connect. You can find all of our career resources. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.